Hello, this is Dr. Shorman, and the title of this presentation is Practicing Godly Creation Stewardship, Dominion, Not Domination. And so just to start with, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, and I'm president of Dive LLC. That's a math and science educational software company. We teach math and science from a biblical creation foundation. I'm a graduate of the University of Texas with degrees in aerospace engineering and marine chemistry there and Texas A&M with a PhD there in aquatic science. I've logged thousands of hours on Texas waterways doing research and as you can tell fishing also sometimes both at the same time. I've spent many hours reviewing on state biology textbook review teams encouraging science in textbooks and I have a new audio adventure coming out spring 2014. I also do research on volcanoes and, and Nova Rupta volcano in particular so I encourage you to take a listen to that audio adventure we have. So my objectives here are to answer three questions. And the first one is, what does biblical creation stewardship look like? Does environmentalism undermine this? And then third, how do we recover proper creation care? So we'll be looking at those three questions. Environmental issues are challenging and complex. And what I want to do is compare 20th century with the 21st century and let's go back to the 20th century and Aldo Leopold he was a conservationist he wrote a book called the Sand County Almanac and I want to read an excerpt from a story that he wrote about a bear in the Arizona New Mexico mountains a mountain called Escadilla which is Spanish for bowl it was home at one time to grizzlies wolves and Apache trout so let's take a look at that story and use that to help us compare 20th century creation stewardship with that in the 21st century. So let's read. There was, in fact, only one place from which you did not see Escadilla on the skyline. There was the top of Escadilla itself. Up there you could not see the mountain, but you could feel it. The reason was the big bear. Old Bigfoot was a robber baron, and Escadilla was his castle. Each spring, when the warm winds had softened the shadows on the snow, the old grizzly crawled out of his hibernation den in the rock slides and... Descending the mountain, bashed in the head of a cow. No one ever saw the old bear, but in muddy springs about the base of the cliffs you saw his incredible tracks. Seeing them made the most hard-bitten cowboys aware of the bear. Bigfoot claimed for his own only a cow a year and a few square miles of useless rocks, but his personality pervaded the county. One spring, Progress sent still another emissary, a government trapper, seeking dragons to slay at government expense. Were there, he asked, any destructive animals in need of slaying? Yes, there was the big bear. The trapper packed his mule and headed for Escadilla. In a month he was back, his mule staggering under a heavy hide. There was only one barn in town big enough to dry it on. He had tried traps, poison, and all his usual wiles to no avail. Then he had erected a set gun in a defile through which only the bear could pass and waited. The last grizzly walked into the stream and shot himself. It was only after we pondered on these things that we began to wonder who wrote the rules for progress. The congressmen who voted money to clear the range of bears were the sons of pioneers. They acclaimed the superior virtues of the frontiersmen, but they strove with might and main to make an end of the frontier. We forest officers who acquiesced in the extinguishment of the bear knew a local rancher who had plowed up a dagger engraved with the name of one of Coronado's captains. We spoke harshly of the Spaniards who, in their zeal for gold and converts, had needlessly extinguished the native Indians. It did not occur to us that we, too, were the captains of an invasion too sure of its own righteousness. Escadilla still hangs on the horizon, but when you see it, you no longer think of the bear. It's only a mountain now. So Aldo Leopold, he was a conservationist. He understood the battles over land use. And he said, public policies for outdoor recreation are controversial. Equally conscientious citizens hold opposite views on what it is and what it should be done to conserve its resource base. Thus, the Wilderness Society seeks to exclude roads from the hinterlands and the Chamber of Commerce to extend them, both in the name of recreation. The game farmer kills hawks and bird lover protects them in the name of shotgun and field glass, respectively. Such factions commonly label each other with short and ugly names when, in fact, each is considering a different component of the recreational process. So, let's take a look at biblical creation stewardship. What does that mean? 
And let's read a passage from Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And in verse 28, Then God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. So let's think about some of those things. What does it mean to be fruitful and multiply? Well, certainly that does include having children, but that's what most people think that's all it means. But it means more than that. It means to bring an increase, like in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, and bringing an increase there that the servant did. And then the fruit of the Spirit, too. There's lots of other examples of what fruitfulness means in Scripture. So in Galatians, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, those kinds of fruits as well. It's more than just about having children. And it's important to think about what it doesn't mean as well. I mean, surely God didn't say that we were supposed to swarm like fire ants, destroy, dominate. That's not what this means. Sometimes Christians get blamed for that is what it means, but it, that's not. Um, that's a in, misinterpretation. It doesn't mean remove any example of God's creativity and replace it with our own. So it's just highways and buildings and cities. That's That's not what have dominion and be fruitful and multiply means. And just think about it. Think about what happened at the first Thanksgiving. Did the Puritans, did they celebrate defeat and destruction of all the Indians, or did they celebrate with the Indians Thanksgiving to God for his provision and protection? Well, they celebrated with them Thanksgiving, right? So they set a good example of of this for us, of what proper stewardship means. And so let's think about that some more. What does it mean to rule over Rules are found by applying the scientific method when we're studying nature. And in Genesis, God commands us to find rules. It's one of his first commands there in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And that's what science is about. Scripture gives us the reason to do science. It's not a science textbook, though. So we have to go find those rules. And it's about dominion, not domination. In the book Resisting the Green Dragon by Dr. James Wanless, he describes godly dominion like love, like love between a husband and a wife, to nourish and cherish. That's what dominion, a proper biblical meaning of it, is. The goal of fallen man, though, is domination and control. And we saw that. That's what Aldo Leopold was against in the 20th century, is domination of nature that's progressivism. Domination of mankind also is a problem, totalitarianism. So godly dominion, it respects the rights of others and their property, neither stealing or coveting. So those are important things to think about. What were some of Adam's first tasks? Dominion or domination? So comparing those things again. Well, Genesis 2, he was told to name the creatures, and that, that's hardly a dominating type of thing. Tend to the garden. God made creation for man. Those, those are not dominating types of things, destructive kinds of activities. And so let's define a conservationist. Leopold was a conservationist. And in Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision and Jesus tells him, rise, kill, and eat. And, and while those verses aren't necessarily about conservationism, I think that pattern, rise, kill, eat, is interesting that Jesus included eat in there, included that use of the land and dominating it, conquering it like just to trophy hunt, just to kill something. That's really not a biblical ethic. And, you know, we can't rise, kill, eat anything, any plant, any animal, if all the animals, all their habitat are destroyed either. And so, you know, you think about it, nobody that I know of wants bad air, bad water, zero wilderness, no bears, no trout, no nothing. I, I don't know anybody who, who wants it like that. So progressive mentality, that's not a biblical mentality. What, what Aldo Leopold was against, that progressive mentality, that rise, kill, conquer mentality, that's not a biblical mentality, just, just to destroy everything, all of God's creation. So again, thinking back to Adam's first task, and, and proper dominion is, is a relationship 
And what's one of the basic things you do in a relationship? It's it's to know somebody's name, right? So to get to know somebody first, or to get to know God's creation, we, we know its name. That was one of Adam's first tasks, was to name things. If you know it, you're more likely to care for it, or, or not. It, it causes you to make a decision to have responsibility for that or, or not, to, to wisely steward it or not. Conservationism, it aimed to make wise use of the earth, to meet human needs now and in future generations. But does environmentalism undermine that? Let's look at that second question there. And thinking about Aldo Leopold again, he was a conservationist or, or was he a preservationist? He grew up in a Christian home. In the excerpts we read, Leopold clearly displays a conservation ethic Christians can support. But his book was written posthumously. It's a collection of essays over a long time span. And where Garden Meets Wilderness by Dr. Calvin Beisner, on page two, he says, Conservationism began its transformation to environmentalism in the second quarter of the 20th century, particularly under the influence of Aldo Leopold. Now, that Leopold did not have a biblical anchor is evident in the changes that developed. So that's interesting. It's kind of like he transitioned from conservationist to preservationist. And and now we call that in the 20th, 21st century, environmentalism. So we've gone from conservationism to environmentalism. And so let's think about that a little bit more and what environmentalism means. Environment, that comes from a French word meaning surroundings, and Dr. Beisner presented this, and he said that essentially environment means everything. It follows that environmentalism means everythingism, and as political scientist Charles Rubin put it in his book, The Green Crusade, everythingism equates with totalitarianism. And so this also, something Dr. Calvin Beisner wrote, is that environmentalism then is inherently totalitarian in character. And that explains why federal and state environmental protection agencies seem to claim authority to regulate more and more of our lives, regardless of constitutional safeguards in the U.S. for liberty and property. So, some attributes of environmentalism. Let's take a look at some of the main attributes. One is control of property to preserve, not conserve. And then devaluing of humans. Maybe you noticed that when I read that excerpt of... Leopold, the way he described the Indians and the bear is kind of like he was lowering the Indian to the level of the bear. And that's what happens with extreme environmentalism. And then also control of human population density. That's another big attribute. There's this fear of too many people. So the beginning of the Sand County Almanac, it describes Abrahamic property as a problem. It's, it's going against biblical concepts. In the foreword, Leopold said, conservation is getting nowhere because it is incompatible with our Abrahamic concept of land. We abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Well, now, in the dominion ethic, though, that's, that's, that's incorrect there. Scripture is clear that God gives land, and we are to exercise godly dominion, not an excessively destructive form of progress over it. A normal person would not abuse their land, just like the, a husband would not abuse his wife in a, in a proper, healthy relationship there. So he's arguing against the Bible, but he's misinterpreting the Bible. Environmentalism, it emphasizes preservation and limited use of land by humans. Some, some ideas there is like Agenda 21, move all the people from the, into cities. Leopold, towards the end of his life, he, he developed this idea called the land ethic. And basically what it is, it's about eliminating man as having dominion. And he wrote about this, he said that in the biotic community, a parallel situation exists. Abraham knew exactly what the land was for. It was to drip milk and honey into Abraham's mouth. Well, yes, it was for that. Just like it's for a bear to eat off of as well. But that's not the only reason it's there. And so he's misinterpreting scripture again. He said, in short, a land ethic changes the role of Homo sapien from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. So see, there's that devaluing of humans, making them no more different than the bear, no more different than a blade of grass even. So that's, that, that's not a proper way to have good stewardship of 
God's creation. Population control. In comparing North America's density with Europe's, Leopold said that America has a better chance for permanence than Europe if she can contrive to limit her density. So the Sierra Club started as a conservationist group, now environmentalists. They say to save our planet, we must change the world. People must learn to live in ways that preserve and protect our precious resources. Not conserve, but preserve. And then they say that devaluing of humans there, they say we were born here, we're part of it, like any ant, fish, rock, or blade of grass. So, so who's responsible for it then, if that's, that's the attitude? That's, that's not good. And then they say to control human population growth and its impacts, that's one of their policies, to limit human population numbers within Earth's carrying capacity. So, I mean, what are they talking about here? What is Earth's carrying capacity? I don't think anybody really knows what that is. And so what I did... I collected some data um, trying to answer that question about Earth's carrying capacity. I looked at 222 countries, I just split them in half, top half, bottom half, and looked at their average per capita GDP. And if a population, if individuals have more money, they're going to be more likely to take better care of nature. But look at this, the top half, they have about twice the GDP of the bottom half. but their population density is over five times higher than the bottom half too. I think it would be opposite just the way environmentalism describes things that you would think that lower population density they'd have more money and and more ability but but really it's it's the higher population densities are the better GDP producers so reality is opposite of environmentalism and its attributes now, it turns out that Leopold was a pantheist, and his son was quoted as saying, I think he was kind of pantheistic. The organization of the universe was enough to take the place of God, if you like. The wonders of nature were, of course, objects of admiration and satisfaction to him. Well, I mean, they are to me, too, but what does Scripture say about this? Professing to be wise, they became fools and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So that's a foolish thing to do, what Leopold was doing. And pantheism, what is that? Well, it's the idea that everything, including God and nature, are one. And a Hindu religion is, is like this. If, if one, then nature has no lawgiver, nor are there any laws of nature. So think about Scripture. It talks about God is creator of the universe. The pantheist says God is the universe. So... There's just this oneness there instead of unity and diversity. Animism, that's a belief that natural objects possess souls. So instead of just the earth being God, it's like there's spirits in the, in the animals and rocks and things like that. Those things don't lead to godly dominion. So let's watch a clip by Vishal Mangalwadi. It's in a new film called Blue, coming out February 24th. And he's a Christian man from India, and so he understands this pantheism really well. So let's listen to that. And if you watch films, say James Cameron's film, Avatar, uh, you would see that uh, Hollywood is promoting earth worship, that we should be worshipping Mother Earth. So in the 1980s and 90s, when there was a movement called the New Age Movement, um, that's where earth worship began to be promoted as part of ecological concern, that instead of establishing our dominion over the earth, uh, we should be worshipping the earth. So it's very much a contemporary qu question. And in fact, that is a logical uh, progression. Once you reject God or a God who exists outside the cosmos, physical cosmos, that is a spiritual being who creates a universe outside of himself. So if you re reject that idea that there is a God who created this universe, then universe is all that you experience, the universe is what you know, and then somehow universe itself has to become a substitute for God, and you have to worship, you're part of the universe, it's much bigger than you, it's the reason you exist, so you worship the, uh, the cosmos, the earth, but 
If you're responsible for nature, it assumes that you are inherently superior to nature. That's why you're responsible. But once you begin to worship nature, then you are making yourself inferior to nature, which is what paganism is. Mm. You're making yourself inferior to nature. So um, the laws have to understand the basic fact that if I'm responsible to take care of nature, I am the ruler, I am the governor of nature. And so the en environmentalists are destroying the basis for environmentalism, which is that man has a unique dignity as made in God's image and created to govern nature. Because our country, such as India, we didn't have this green movement. So in fact, as you would, if you come to India, you will see that there's a lot more pollution, a lot more degradation of nature, uh, because we didn't have this idea that we are greater than nature, created to rule it. The, we were worshiping Mother Earth, and Mother was supposed to take care of us, not we taking care of the Mother. So let's take a look at pantheism and animism in the United States, going back to the Thanksgiving time and the Mohawk Indian Thanksgiving address. If you have a passport, U.S. passport, this is actually on the inside of the passport, and it says, quote, We send thanks to all the animal life in the world. They have many things to teach us as people. We are glad they are still here, and we hope it will always be so. Well, I'm glad they're still here, too. I hope it will always be so as well, but I don't send my thanks to them. I don't put myself down on their level. That's that's just a bad way to try to be a good steward of creation is to think that the animals have a lot to teach us. I mean, they do have things that we can learn by, by watching them, but if we have God, if we have a hierarchy there of God, then man, then nature, and, and having dominion over nature, that is a better way to provide proper stewardship. Now, another non-Christian religion that is related to environmentalism is polytheism, worship of many gods. And interestingly, the 2010 United Nations Climate Summit, it opened with Christiana Figueres prayer to the goddess Ixchel. And a report said that describing the mythic entity as a goddess associated with the moon, reason, creativity and weaving, while carefully omitting Ixchel's association with war, human sacrifice, and cannibalism, Figueres called on Ixchel to, quote, inspire the climate delegates. So, I guess if they were looking for a, a good goddess here for environmentalism and population control and things like that, then the goddess Ixchel was the right goddess to pick. But, anyway, that's environmentalism it, it leads to less not more responsibility for God's creation and a good example here along the Gulf Coast where I live is red snapper management by the federal government and mismanagement is really what it is there's increasingly restrictive policies for sport fishermen a preservationist mentality and in in the western Gulf of Mexico oil and gas platforms have over the years developed and, and provided incredible artificial habitat for them. But now it's, it's interesting, they, they're protecting the red sapper population, saying it's overfished, but at the same time the federal government is destroying their habitat through something called the Idle Iron Program. So it's just a crazy amount of confusion there that, that's leading to less, not more responsibility for God's creation. And Texas Governor Rick Perry, he's been at odds over this artificial reef program. That, that picture on the right there, you can see dead red snapper there um, from an, uh, an oil platform that was exploded and d dismantled using explosives. And so it kills the fish. It kills not just red snapper, but any of the marine life that's around them. Sea turtles, all kinds of animals use this artificial habitat. So, how can we recover 
proper creation care rather than this this mess that we see a lot of times with the federal government and and state government sometimes too one way is to as to put human worth as well as responsibility back where it needs to be and and one place that's found is in free markets so let's listen to another clip from this new film blue coming out february 24 2014 and dr calvin beisner is going to describe why we won't run out of oil For every extractive resource, the long-term price trend, and there are ups and downs in between, but the long-term price trend is sharply downward. Now that downward price trend is a clear economic signal that the resources, mineral, plant, animal, are more abundant now than they were before, even though we've used some up. We've used far more oil than the entire known world reserves of 1940. But the entire known world reserves today are far greater than they've been at any time in history. Now, this is because we find other ways to find oil, we find more efficient ways to get oil out of the ground, we do all sorts of things like this, which by the way, comes from the fact that God made us in his image to be intelligent. We're using the logos that God gave us as part of his image to learn more about how to get more oil out of the ground at, at lower and lower cost to us and how to use it more and more efficiently and how to substitute other things for oil. So no, we are not running out of resources. We are in fact watching resources become more and more abundant and more and more affordable. That's because people make resources and the more people are, there are, the more resources they make. But what if we run out of oil? If we run out of oil, we'll switch to some other energy source, some other plastic source. There, there are other ways to do those things. But the fact is, for one thing, we never will run out of oil. That's because if oil, if actual quantities of oil out there in the earth become small enough, the price of extracting it will, and, and using it will become so high that nobody will bother with it, with it anymore. Why aren't we worried now about running out of whale oil? In the late 19th century, people were worried about running out of whale oil. We're not worried about it because as its price rose while the whale population dwindled, eventually that, that sent a signal economically. There's money to be made by providing substitutes for whale oil. And Thomas Edison went to work and after 900 and some experiments, he perfected the incandescent light bulb and that gave us a way to use electricity to make light instead of whale oil. Demand for whale oil plummeted around the world, bingo, the whale populations came back. Similarly, if we ever reach that point where we're running out of oil, uh, the price will rise so high that it will push us to use other things as a substitute. And uh, historically, we keep discovering that the new substitutes are cheaper than the old ones. And yes, the whales are back. And here's some footage I shot in 2012 in Monterey Bay of a blue whale. So, recovering proper creation care, putting humans at the proper place in creation, a biblical ethic there, using science for what it is, not futurology claims. Look at this chart here and related to global warming from 1983 to 1997. We did have global warming. The climate did warm up worldwide and there's the carbon dioxide emissions, that gray bar there. and we can see the the level of that and typically that's that's the alarmist attitude about this is that human co2 emissions are causing global warming well if they were then for the next 14 year period 1998 to 2012 why is the temperature flat and actually decreasing a little bit even though co2 emissions have gone up so there's there's the science is showing us that this global warming hysteria you know now they do call it climate change typically but but it's they mean global warming the 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 left does but there's confusion over this the earth, the earth is mostly covered by water right water vapor is the number one greenhouse gas so th there's clearly something else that causes the climate to fluctuate and and is a much more significant factor than carbon dioxide. Let's listen as Lord Moncton, he was a science policy advisor for Margaret Thatcher. Let's listen to him talk about So this. I think the solution 
to all this is to realize that the hard left, the fascists, the communists, the socialists, call them what you will, the totalitarians, the legalists, they have clambered on to this global warming bandwagon just at the moment when all the wheels have fallen off. So they're going nowhere with it. And everybody can see, except themselves, that they're going nowhere with it. We will respond to the threat of climate change. Of course, they have the media. They, they took it over by stealth over the last 30 years. They control it now. The media are still in the tank for this nonsense and will not even print facts, like the fact that there hasn't been any warming now for 17 years, according to the head of the UN's climate panel. But the people are finding out. I go around the world telling people what the facts are telling them where to find them. My speeches go up on YouTube. They sometimes get millions of hits. People are finding out that the media are not telling them the truth about this, that they are in the tank for the communist faction. And because they've got the science so badly wrong, we are going to be able to say, if you couldn't trust the hard left on this subject, which they said was their number one subject, which they said they could not be in doubt about, which they said they were sure about. And as a matter of objective scientific truth, they have now been demonstrated to have been talking complete nonsense. Then why should you trust them on anything else they talk about? The mistake the left made in trying to politicize even science itself is that the Almighty has a sense of humor. And when Tim Flannery here, the chief climate commissar, came out and said we would never again see rain in this area, in the Murray-Darling Basin, which is where most people in Australia live. A few months later, the heavens opened and they had the heaviest rain they'd ever recorded in the region, which he then promptly blamed on global warming. <laughs> and people can see now that it is ridiculous. Yeah. And you don't need to be a scientist to see how ridiculous these people have become. And the left are committing political harakiri by, by continuing to adhere to the global warming storyline when it is now blindingly obvious even to the non-scientist that they're talking nonsense. And so this from Lord Moncton on February 6, 2014. Satellites show no global warming for 17 years, 5 months. That's a long time without any global warming. And how can we recover proper creation care? Let's finish up here. Know the Creator and his creation. It's that relationship of dominion, not domination, having a good relationship with him and his creation. You know, Jesus rebuked the Sadducees in Matthew 22, 29, telling them that they were in error because they did not know scripture or the power of God. And interestingly, Francis Bacon, the founder of the scientific method, this verse, he based a couple of his books called The Advancement of Learning, two volumes, off of this verse right here. So having that relationship, and, and Bacon put a proper hierarchy there too, studying first scripture, then the creatures expressing his power. So, so there is a proper order there as well. So being diligent in Bible study, prayer, worship, evangelism, remembering that we were created from the dust of the earth. God wants us to know our deep connection to the material earth as well. And, and just thinking about near my hometown, um, Spring Creek, that runs into the San Jacinto River, that goes into Lake Houston, that goes into Galveston Bay, that goes into the Gulf of Mexico, which goes into the Atlantic Ocean, which goes into all the other world's oceans. So what we do at our house, the way we treat nature, that does affect everything else. And, and so we have a responsibility to, to have proper dominion over it. To not rise, kill, conquer, but rise, kill, eat building a relationship there by hunting, fishing, gardening, farming, exercising dominion, not domination, making that distinction. So I hope this presentation has helped you understand that distinction especially and, and what proper creation care looks like.